Hello, my name is Dante Rooker, and thank you for joining us for this special edition of Middle Tennessee News as we mark the 100th year anniversary of broadcast with a little Tennessee twist. And I'm Cheyenne Avila. In the next half hour, we'll explore the roots of radio in Music City and sit down with some of Tennessee's broadcasting icons. And I'm Kristen Allen. We're gonna look at the present and future of broadcast, but first, we're gonna take you back to where it all started. Anyone on the air? Voice radio was at first a novelty, mainly for hobbyists and engineers. Amateur broadcasters had been transmitting since 1906. Reginald Fessenden's Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve wireless voice and music transmissions to mainly ships at sea were technically the first. But after World War I, companies started making radios for home use and the general public. Radio manufacturing company Westinghouse wanted to offer regular programming so they could sell more radios. A Pittsburgh area ham operator, Dr. Frank Conrad, had been playing music over the air for friends just for fun. Westinghouse asked Conrad to set up a regular transmitting station. On November 2, 1920, station KDKA in Pittsburgh made the nation's first commercial radio broadcast. It was on election day. Warren G. Harding had just become president. Of course, music became ingrained in American culture and here in Music City. Middle Tennessee News reporter Zoe Haggart joins us with the history of the Grand Ole Opry. It's an American icon, the heart of country music and the soul of Music City Broadcasting. It's the Grand Old Opry, and it began as a simple radio broadcast right here back in 1925. Today, it's a national phenomenon. Xavier Mastin and I sat down with head Opry archivist and WSM broadcast engineer to discuss the history and impact of the Opry. It's Grand Ole Opry time! Happy Grand Ole Opry! What do you think of when you hear the Grand Old Opry? Probably think of all the famous stars like Minnie Pearl, DeFord Bailey, Johnny and June Cash. But what many don't think of is how broadcasting as we know it today in Nashville began with WSM back in 1925. And head Opry archivist Jen Larson says history wouldn't have been the same without it. I'm realizing how integral the radio station actually is to the story of the Grand Old Opry and the development of country music, not only in Nash Nashville, but also a national and now, you know, certainly international platform for that genre of music has been coming out of Nashville since 1925 on WSM. When Jack DeWitt Jr. sent out some of the first radio frequencies in October 1925, the development of broadcasting was in the earliest of stages. Owned by an insurance company, the development of We Shield Millions, or WSM, was born. They broadcasted a little country barn dance in an old Nashville church and unknowingly became pioneers of broadcasting. WSM broadcast engineer Jason Cooper says the impact of WSM's Opry show went beyond its Nashville audience. They were the first stations to use the big, uh, what they call series fed radiator, which is a big tall, like the tower you see out there in Brentwood. Uh, up until before that, they used uh, dipole towers, which were two towers with a wire in between. Um, Jack DeWitt made that call when he came on board for the power increase. The Opry has, I think in some measure, it, it sort of balances tradition with innovation. Probably without WSM and all of that engineering and technological development, um, you know, the Opry might not have developed and the, certainly the history of country music wouldn't have been quite the same without it. Outreach was expanded when in 1939, WSM was picked up by NBC attracting both listeners and country stars. Just the, the whole technology environment is shifting, and, and so it's allowing for these performers that who, to come out of places that um, normally they would just be sort of living out their lives very quietly and playing for their local communities and maybe, maybe traveling within 50 miles of where they grew up. The actual birth of WSM came out of um, outreach to rural America by um, when people started having that disposable income. 
the audience is coming from, from largely, I think, from people that have moved out of their rural hometowns into, into urban areas looking for work. So there's this kind of nostalgia about looking back to the old home place. Um, so a lot of the themes that you hear in early country music are established. What makes it kind of enduringly popular is that we have so many intergenerational stories, like where people's parents and grandparents remember coming to the Ryman Auditorium, you know, and seeing Ernest Tubb, seeing Bill Monroe, seeing Loretta Lynn, George Jones, Tammy Wynette, legions of stars that have come along the way. These do become like really embedded uh, and dear memories because music is such a touchstone to memory, I think. They were just having a good time doing their thing, uh, enjoying the music, and uh, that's, I think that's what made it work, probably. Everybody just seemed to be having a real good time. The enduring popularity of the Grand Old Opry comes from its music, that classic sound of country music that makes its listeners nostalgic for the old home place, while its contributions to broadcasting today will never be forgotten. One step more, the circle has been unbroken for 95 years and counting. Country and gospel music traditions run deep here in Tennessee. Reporter Denisha Hunt recently traveled to Memphis to a radio station, filling the airwaves with heavenly sounds. Memphis is known for their gospel station, 95.7 Inspiration Station. Eileen Carrier shares some history behind the music. W-H-A-L, that's the call letters for Hallelujah FM, uh, started in 2001 here in Memphis, Tennessee. Clear Channel, which is probably the largest broadcast company in the United States, started expanding. And they wanted to expand their reach. They had hip hop, they had urban adult contemporary, they had country, they had all other formats, but they didn't have a 24 hour gospel radio station. Even though Eileen is a minority in her career field, she explains why she does not experience discrimination at work. I didn't have a problem uh, with race at all because gospel is a black format. It's Christian based, but gospel, and then you have uh, Christian, you have Christian Latino. Gospel is all segmented, just like every other format. Over the years of her working at 95.7, she realizes the impact she has on the listeners. Finding out how we impact the lives of the people. We take for granted a lot of times when we are just kind of listening to radio, um, but the people on the other side, they become so intertwined in our lives. And when we get feedback from the people that have listened to us for so long and how much the words that we say impacted their lives. That's just amazing. Still ahead on this Middle Tennessee News special, 100 years of broadcast. Radio gets new competition from wires and lights in a box and a Nashville TV icon shares his story when we come back. Hi, I'm Xavier Mastin. Thanks for watching this special edition of Middle Tennessee News as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first commercial radio broadcast by honoring broadcasters in Tennessee. Check our website for more special content. You can find it at middletennesseenews.net under the Specials tab. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Once there was a boy who did the same thing again and again. One day he was told he had autism. He got help and slowly learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org.
got the money I've got the time We'll go honky-tonkin' And we'll have a time I'm Dee Dee West. Broadcasting stations are a necessity in the Black household. From car rides to cleaning days, these stations have navigated Black households through historical movements and celebrations and are always keeping Black communities both informed and entertained. In Nashville, much of it roots back to here at Fisk University. Dean Curry! Hey! Okay, how are you? Sharon Kay has been the general manager at Jazzy 88 WFSK at Fisk University since 2005, when she became the first woman to hold such a position. She is no stranger to the media scene in Nashville. It's called What's the 411 with Sharon Kay. And uh, celebrating 20 years um, on the air in Nashville. Uh, it was started, it took a couple years to start it. And, uh, it was 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And people were tuned in because I was getting them Sunday rides and going in to church at work. And there's this me talking to them on this station that they've been hearing sometimes gospel on Sunday music and all that. And here I am busting through with, you know, empowerment and encouragement. Kay believes it is important to use her platform to support her community and credits local support for the longtime success of WFSK. Joe Major is a host for iHeartRadio's 101.1 The Beat, Nashville's number one hip-hop and R&B station. The TSU grad believes radio should better reflect the diversity that exists within the city. What is being promoted and put out and has been this way for a very long time is the country music aspect um, of the city. And that is not the sole representation of what Nashville is. While both Kay and Major believe black radio stations are often overlooked, they believe the future for radio broadcasting is bright. And I think the future of radio is a combination of everything that's current and relevant, which is streaming, uh, podcasting, uh, visual work, uh, digital, you know what I'm saying, content creating, um, just all of what it, what new modern entertainment is, that is what radio should be headed towards. And one-on-one, -on -one, um, more specifically, is kind of headed towards. A hundred years ago today, the first commercial radio broadcast gave listeners election results before the morning paper even reached their doorstep. Tomorrow, Another election day. Broadcasters across the nation will be updating Americans on election results. And among them is a familiar voice in public radio in Murfreesboro. Kristen Allen has the story. I learned to edit using, literally, using a razor blade and scotch tape on reels of magnetic tape. The radio industry has come a long way since Mike Osborne got his first job as a disc jockey in the 1960s. It used to be that when you uh, started in radio, you had to actually have a federal license uh, to be able to just talk on the radio. Just to be a DJ, you had to have a license. And you Long gone are the days of FCC radio licenses and actual record spitting on the airwaves. But that's not the only thing that's changed about one of the first live forms of entertainment and information. According to Nielsen Media researchers, radio is accessible to about 90% of Americans, but only 250,000 people regularly tune in. Many say radio itself is dying. Uh, radio, I, I think that's still up in the air. Of course, people have been trying to kill radio off for uh, many decades now. <laughs> Although the advent of television and internet has hurt radio audiences, it hasn't threatened audio. I'm always surprised uh, at the number of people, uh, especially young people who are uh, seem so um, really into podcasts. Podcasts are beginning to look like the radio of tomorrow, with over 144 million Americans subscribed to at least one. About 50% of those listeners are between the ages of 21 and 35. There is something about sound uh, and the way sound uh, can help, uh, way sound can be used, both uh, voice uh, and natural sounds can be used 
to um, cause the, the human mind to paint pictures. Osborne says it's the next round of storytellers that give radio airwaves a future. I think uh, radio still has a future of uh, inspiring imagination in, in the minds of, of listeners. Most of the Tennessee radio stations we've highlighted are a part of broadcasting companies. But for one station, broadcasting is a family affair, creating a special bond between father and son. Here's some of the businesses we're in town. Can't go back too far because there's a McDonald's. John McCreary, or as others call him, Coach Mack, has been a high school journalism teacher in Middle Tennessee for many years. But what many people don't know is his journalism career actually started way back when he was a child and with his father, John Sr. Radio um, just has always been a part of my life. It, it, was, it was a part of my life even before my life. My dad... Um, my dad started in radio in, in I think, 1961, and um, when we got to Murf when he moved to Murfreesboro, uh, there was a radio station at that time, WMTS, that uh, was located on Broad Street. John Sr. became a disc jockey for WMTS in 1964, and his son John was born a year later. Little did he know that his first job in radio was going to be when he was just three years old. I stood in front of a microphone and did um, voiceovers and, um, and one-liners for some of the disc jockeys. And uh, there's a famous one where uh, I start out with, um, you're listening to, and I turn around and say, I forgot. And that was one that I think every you know, disc jockey at the station used for a while because it was just some little kid saying, you know, this is whatever, WMTS radio and you're listening to. I forgot, and so it was just one of those little moments. But it still follows me to this day with those guys who used it uh, way back then. With famous one-liners like cool as a breeze in the trees and chilly today and hot tamale, John Sr. was characterized as being one of the last fastest talking top 40 DJs from the 1960s and 70s. John Sr. decided to take a small group of people to another radio station, WGNS, where his career took a giant leap. With WGNS focusing on the local aspect of Murfreesboro, this allowed him to dive deep into the world of radio promotions. We would do things like a back to school car where you would register to guess the price of the car and all the, uh, all the prizes inside. They brought Wolfman Jack to town one time for a promotion out at where Roses used to be, which is not even uh, a place anymore out there in Mercury Plaza. Uh, but those kinds of promotions, people still talk about them. I still have people that mention the fact that, you know, something that happened in radio during that era, and they would credit my dad with that promotion because that's what dad did. He just promoted and promoted and promoted. In 1980, John Sr. bought the WMTS AM radio station where his son's radio career began. Working mo Sunday mornings, listening to a lot of preachers, and... Um, and playing gospel music. And slowly but surely, uh, over time, I'd collect a few extra shifts, work some weekends, uh, moved into a, an afternoon shift when I graduated high school, and uh, after probably four years, uh, became the morning disc jockey. In 1987, the father and son duo put on a television station in town called TV 27, where they focused on elementary, high school, and college football. It wasn't until 1993 when John realized he needed to do something else to help pay the bills. I got an opportunity to start a video program, a video production program at Laverne High School, and, um, and I was able to get into coaching, which is something that I really wanted to do. John's father passed away in 2003, but his legacy still lives on. I pretty much thought my dad was a radio genius, and I found out afterward, after he passed away, that a lot of people felt that way, um, that he knew a lot about the industry. He knew, he knew how to take a business that was struggling, do a little promotion, and then and, and let them understand the power of radio. That is one of the many key pieces of his dad's life that John still holds close to his heart. Still ahead on the celebration of 100 years of broadcast, a Tennessee television icon, and a look ahead into the future of broadcasting. Hey there, I'm Morgan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us for this very special edition of Middle Tennessee News as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first commercial radio broadcast. You can find more special content from us on our website, middletennesseenews.net, under the Specials tab. <laughs> Once there was a boy who did the same thing again and again. 
One day, he was told he had autism. He got help and slowly learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, I'm Kristen Allen. Tennessee has produced a number of legends in the last 100 years, one of those being Chris Clark. Clark was an anchor here in Nashville for over 40 years, making him one of the longest serving television personalities in state history. We sat down with him virtually to talk about the news, where it is, where it's been, and where it's going. I got in the TV news business in 1961, and it was very easy to find a job back then. If you fail to see the big news, you may miss something important. Chris Botsaris began his 40-year career in black and white at a station in Albany, Georgia. He changed his name to get on TV. Back in those days, in the 60s, you couldn't be on television news if you were female, if you were of color, or if you had a sort of a funny-sounding last name. Covering stories as small as fender benders and as big as the civil rights movement. The cases will be followed up by the federal government. We didn't discuss uh, the Mississippi cases. I hit that TV station just as Dr. Martin Luther King was coming to Albany to integrate Albany, Georgia. So I got to meet him, know him, interview him. He moved from Albany to Atlanta, where his anchor competition was Tom Brokaw. But in 1966, Nashville came calling. This is when Clark began his 41-year tenure at News Channel 5, becoming a pioneer in the TV news industry. Anything we did was like walking in a fresh field of snow. Nobody had ever done it before. He questioned presidents. Will you honor such a subpoena? Well, I think in response to that. Helped to get cameras inside Tennessee courtrooms. That complete trials we put on the cable television. That's, uh, that's almost a given. And even gave one of Tennessee's favorite stars her big break. He took a chance on me, however, and I thought, that if I just, you know, pretended to be Barbara Walters, whatever that meant for me, watching her on the Today Show at the time, that everything would work so out. You're watching News Channel 5 at 6 with Chris Clark. Retiring from the TV news business in 2007, Clark is watching what is happening to the industry. That's what we're seeing right now, an attack on the free press, the credibility of the free press. It was always assumed the press was telling the truth back in those days. He says you viewers know. should question everything. The news consumer ought to be skeptical. I welcome skepticism. Question what you see. And if it's the truth and if it's accurate, if it's right down the middle, then you'll find that out. We talked about the future of journalism and challenges the next generation will face with the evolution of digital media. Reporters, I think they have a lot of stories to turn now. They're going to have a lot more to do. So it's going to be really, uh, really busy and reporters are going to have to have a lot of skills fast out of the box. And he offers this advice to those looking to become the Chris Clarks of tomorrow. Be their observer and report on them, point with pride when they're right, and look at disdain when they're wrong. A beloved anchor. Yes. I'm 70 years old and I've watched you all these years. Oh my Lord, you've been watching me since you were a little girl, haven't you? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, I have. Looking out for the next generation. 2020 has certainly been a year we won't soon forget. Everyone's had to make adjustments, including those delivering the news. Year 2020, 
also known as the COVID year, a year where everyone has adjusted. I've been working from home this whole time, so my living room is my TV studio. Through the entire pandemic, WBIR reporter and MTSU alum Katie Inman, along with other journalists, continued to provide constant updates involving coronavirus. But not even they were prepared to be interviewing people in their own home. It has affected every part, and at the beginning, it's like, okay, we only did Zoom interviews, and we only used file video, and we only, um, we couldn't leave our houses pretty much. We were like quarantined, essentially. Dr. Katie Foss, professor and author of the book that's getting national attention, Constructing the Outbreak, says that we've never seen anything like COVID. We've never had uh, an epidemic this, or a pandemic this big in our digital era. And that's what really sets apart COVID-19 from some of these past epidemics, is that we've definitely had epidemics, but not at a pandemic level. Although journalists are taking precautions to not interview in person, other services like Zoom and FaceTime have made it possible to retrieve information. Journalists don't have to put themselves at risk in the same way that they would have had to tell the story 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Zoom interviews may be safer, but are still challenging. Doing interviews through the screen, it's kind of weird because you're not able to really read a person's full body language. You're not able to take um, as many, you're not able to pick up on as many cues. You know, if someone's getting ready to cry or something, it's like you're not able to really tell that through, through the screen. Hi, I'm Haley Perkins. Thanks for watching this special edition of Middle Tennessee News as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first commercial radio broadcast by honoring broadcasters in Tennessee. You can check out specific content by going to our website, middletennesseenews.net, and clicking 100th anniversary under the special report tab. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Never gonna let you go. Once there was a boy who did the same thing again and again. One day he was told he had autism. 
He got help and slowly learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org.